1992, after the fall of the system in the Soviet Union, the toppled statues were assembled in Gorky Park in Moscow. Visitors came and walked through these toppled statues. When I went there, I saw some children playing around with a scarf of the Young Pioneer Movement, a scarf that m nearly every kid needed to wear at some point. When I realized that they started to blindfold the statue of Stalin, I realized that it was a very symbolic act because Stalin had blindfolded the people that, that were executed during his reign. When photographing a story on pollution, in the former Soviet Union, um, we came across a cluster of children being afflicted with missing forearms in two Moscow neighborhoods. To photograph these children, I decided to choose a straightforward portrait situation. I got the children together in a typical Soviet gym with green paint in the background and originally had photographed the children each with their mothers uh, who had accompanied them to be photographed. This way the children were really relaxed but initially they were wearing yellow, green, uh, red sweaters so that I did not see their malformation clearly. Therefore, I had asked the mothers to agree that the children would be uh, photographed undressed at the end of the shoot at a point when they were already really relaxed. Initially, I had 11 children that were assembled from the same Moscow neighborhood. Three of the children fe felt really uncomfortable and I let them step out of the picture. So I ended up with eight children being fairly relaxed, looking into the camera, um, and all of them had the left forearm missing. The image is a reflection of the socio-economic situation in Russia after the fall of the Soviet Union. In the early 90s, men gathered on weekends to drill holes into the ice of the Ural River, which is the separation between Asia and Europe. The Lenin steelworks in the background were one of the largest steelworks in all of the Soviet Union with 200,000 employees. The steelworks polluted the river so badly that often the men fishing did not consume the fish themselves, but rather sold them on nearby markets. During my travels in Russia, I photographed President Putin, uh, Prime Minister Putin several times. This uh, photograph was taken during a state visit of the German Chancellor Gerhard Schröder to Russia and people who know Gerhard Schröder uh, very well will recognize him being obstructed by the gentleman on the right in the picture. I photographed this image as part of a story called Russia Rising and wanted deliberately to block out the German Chancellor. I therefore partially hit behind the shoulders of the gentleman uh, on the right, using him to block the view to uh, the German Chancellor. When the gentleman on the right moved further right to give me full view of both of them, I continued to move behind his shoulder, and at that point, Putin, who was trained in the KGB, gave me this stern look, uh, 
basically asking, what the hell are you doing there? A father meditates during the day walking the grounds of a very isolated monastery in the Russian winter. He and four or five other monks living there, isolated far away from the nearest town. The image tells about the Russian winter. It tells the typical architecture of Russian churches and at the same time the isolation of the church. It is, however, one of many monasteries and uh, churches that were reopened after 70 years of church prosecution. This photograph was taken as part of a story on Moscow at night. Actually, in English, it was called Moscow Never Sleeps. In the photograph, we see a woman rushing to the entrance of the GUM department store, shielding herself from the biting cold in Moscow. Moscovites, or even Russians in general, tend to stay up much longer at night and sleep late in the mornings. During that story, I not only photographed in public spaces, like here at the entrance of the GUM de department store in the center of Moscow adjacent to Red Square, but also visited clubs, restaurants, and tried to shed a light on the downside in Moscow, the many homeless people in the streets of Moscow. Like an angel of the night, this woman supplies homeless people with money and care and food. In this situation, she administers help uh, to a homeless person who has open sores at his leg, a very typical occurrence for people that are homeless in Moscow. She collects funds from her friends and her family and a few wealthy people and does this pretty much all by herself. At Epiphany, many religious Russians flock to the lakes and seas where holes are being dug into the ice. They take a dip in the icy water because they believe that that cleanses the souls of sins. President Nazarbayev of Kazakhstan single-handedly moved the capital of the country from Almaty, later known as Almaty, to the small town of Astana in the north of Kazakhstan. This small town has been completely rebuilt with modern buildings and in this image we see people flocking from the countryside to visit the new construction. I see myself as a participatory photographer, meaning that I'm very close in with the people. Here I am dancing with the people in Sevastopol on the Crimea celebrating a simple day out at a warm summer night. My two main subjects of work, ecological subjects and the work in the former Soviet Union, come together in Chernobyl. For many years I've covered Chernobyl for National Geographic but also on my own. At this picture, we are in the ghost town of Pripyat. Pripyat was initially erected for the workers and their families in the vicinity of the Chernobyl reactor itself. When the reactor exploded, 
the people of Pripyat were evacuated, however, only after 36 to 48 hours. The classroom in the school shows the abrupt departure from Chernobyl. In the background, we see still the images of Soviet dignitaries, but over the years, through leaking ceilings, trees have grown inside this classroom. I was deeper inside the destroyed Chernobyl reactor than any Western still photographer. I followed a group of six workers into the belly of the beast. It was their job to secure pillars to stabilize the roof. Besides of protective gear, they were additionally wearing gas masks and oxygen tanks. Their exposure was limited to 15 minutes per day. During one of my visits into the interior of the Chernobyl reactor, which I call the belly of the beast, I followed an engineer more falling than really moving through the hallways. In front of a huge metal door, he indicated that I should get my cameras ready to shoot. It took him a while to pry the door open, and I stumbled into a room. I managed to get off a round of strobes and wanted to wait until my strobe recharged but he already pulled me back at my shoulders uh, up and pushed me out of the door, indicating that we had enough radiation in there. When I looked at the display of my camera, I realized it was all out of focus. I begged him to go back one more time, and he agreed. I was able to shoot off another round of strobes the reason why I wanted to go back was that in the back of the room, I had seen a frozen clock. It stopped at 1.23 a.m. in the morning of April 26, 1986, the moment when time stood still in Chernobyl forever. An estimated 800,000 liquidators were involved in the cleanup after the Chernobyl accident. They were brought to Chernobyl over the years from all parts of the former Soviet Union. The man on the left was part of a cleanup crew that was forced to destroy the wells in the zone to discourage people from returning. The boy on the right lived in the area and, according to his mother, went often to the woods to eat berries. Both now received thyroid surgery at the hospital in Minsk. Thyroid abnormalities are the undisputed results of radiation. A mentally handicapped child gets lost in the scent of a tulip in an orphanage in uh, southern Belarus. The orphanage receives funds from Chernobyl charities. After the accident, the nuclear fallout drifted northwest, uh, contaminating a large portion of Belarus.